Um, I'm Rory Little, and I am uh, on the uh, Council of the Criminal Justice Section of the ABA and a law professor at UC Hastings College of the Law here in San Francisco. And it's my honor to be the moderator for this panel. This is the 25th year that I have put this panel together and done a moderation. Um, you will see that it is uh, no bells and whistles in this panel, uh, no PowerPoint, uh, no t it's a low tech, no tech, and there's a written handout which, um, uh, you know, is thick with summaries of every case that the Supreme Court heard this past term that had to do with criminal law. Uh, I will say what I say every year, which is that this is a draft, it is full of typos still, and if you want to get an electronic copy to circulate uh, to your offices or whoever, uh, you can email me. My email is at the bottom of the front page. And I would be happy to send you a copy in about a week that hopefully will have less typos in it and other things. Um, I can't really think of a better, uh, more informed group of people to present to you on a summary of the Supreme Court's term uh, on the criminal side than the three people that I have with me today. And I'll tell you just a little bit about them. I won't go into great detail on their bio. Um, and I know at the end, we will certainly be happy to take your questions. Uh, the way we have done this in the past is as we're going along discussing cases, if you would have a question about a particular case when it is discussed, you can feel free to raise your hand or whatever and let me know at that time and we can talk about it then. Uh, you know, we won't go on at length because we're going to try to cover a number of cases. We will not cover every case in the term. We will cover um, only, only the ones that the speakers believe are sort of most uh, prominent for, for their presentation. So uh, seated here to my immediate right is Brian Stretch. Brian Stretch uh, has been a career prosecutor for over 20 years, both on the state side and the federal side uh, in California. He was born and raised in San Francisco. Uh, and currently serves as the United States Attorney for the Northern District of California here in San Francisco. Uh, the Northern District of California is one of the largest geographic districts in the country uh, and one of the largest in terms of personnel and I think one of the largest in terms of variety of cases. Um, Brian oversees an office of well over 100 lawyers and well over I think 200 or 300 in staff uh, in three different branches, San Jose, Oakland, and San Francisco. Um, there are huge financial centers here in San Francisco, as you know. Uh, the center of uh, the high-tech, if you will, industry, Google, and et cetera, in the Northern District. And there are violent drug cartels that operate in the Northern District, which extends all the way up to the Oregon border uh, and, and everything in between. Uh, so Brian comes to us with a long and deep uh, career in criminal law, and we're really lucky to have him. Uh, seated next to him is Justice Leandra Kruger from the California Supreme Court. Uh, some of you may not recognize Justice Kruger. Um, I think the dean of my law school uh, actually saw me having lunch with her a few months ago and came to me afterwards and said, who was that student you were eating with? Uh, Justice Kruger uh, is one of the youngest people ever appointed to the California Supreme Court. She was appointed at the age of 38 two years ago by Governor Jerry Brown. Um, she, uh, I like to say this, uh, she is the only justice in the history of the state of California to have a child while sitting on the bench. Her daughter is five months old, and so we're again lucky to have her. Uh, and uh, Justice Kruger, before coming to California's Supreme Court first was uh, born and raised in Southern California and then served in Washington DC as the, or well, in the Solicitor General's office for the United States, uh, rose to the level of the principal deputy uh, Solicitor General at one point and has argued 12 cases in the United States Supreme Court uh, over time and she may talk about uh, an area having to do with prior convictions which uh, is something that she developed a bit of a specialty uh, in, while in the Solicitor General's office. Uh, now seated to her right is Dennis Reardon. Uh, Dennis Reardon is someone I have known uh, for uh, decades here in San Francisco. Uh, originally from New York, uh, but arrived in uh, our city some 40 years ago. Um, 
it's, it's difficult to capsulize what Dennis Reardon has done. He has represented more prominent people on appeal, both criminal and civil, uh, than I could list for you, starting with Patty Hearst uh, back in the 1970s. Um, he has argued in the Supreme Court, United States Supreme Court, a number of times. Um, and I would say that he has quietly and steadily become one of the most respected appellate litigators in the United States. Um, and uh, has a very active practice, not just in the Supreme Court, but in the Ninth Circuit and other courts. Uh, I know had an argument just a week or two ago in the Ninth Circuit. Um, represented Barry Bonds, some of you have probably heard of him, uh, and was successful in having uh, that conviction reversed on appeal. So uh, again, a, a really talented group, uh, and I want to thank them for being here. Um, and thanks to all of you as well. I'm going to give you a brief look at the Supreme Court term, very brief, and then we're going to turn it over to uh, our panelists. Uh, th the biggest event of this past term, some of you may recall, is that Justice Scalia passed away in February. Uh, the attention span of the United States uh, public is so short that we, we hardly remember that. That was last uh, n news cycle, not this one. But that has made a huge difference in the United States Supreme Court. It has. Uh, the, the number of cases in which cert was granted was remarkably lower until the very end of the term. Uh, the pace of oral argument has been changed because he was a very active questioner. Uh, and the colorful writing that he was well known for uh, has largely not been uh, duplicated by uh, the remaining justices. Although Justice, um, Justice Alito, I believe in the Mathis case, wrote one of the most entertaining dissents you're ever going to read. So. If you want to read a dissent uh, with entertainment, read the Mathis case. Um, the Supreme Court heard about 69 cases this year, which is low from 20 years ago, but is consistent with their most recent uh, few years. Uh, about 40% of those were related to the criminal law, either direct criminal cases or uh, civil cases that involve criminal law issues. Um, Justice Thomas ended up writing the most of any justice in the criminal law area, I think because after February, uh, he felt the need to take up the slack, if you will, on some of the cases where undoubtedly Justice uh, Scalia would have, um, would have written. Uh, justice Thomas, also a notable event this past term, asked the first question he's asked from the bench in 10 years uh, in a case which uh, did not involve the Second Amendment until uh, the very end of the argument when uh, the Solicitor General's uh, assistant was about to sit down, at which point uh, there was a rumble from Justice Thomas's direction and everyone head jerked on a swivel and audible gasps went through the courtroom and he asked not just one question but 12, having to do with the Second Amendment aspects of this gun case called Voisin, V-O-I-S-I-N-E, and uh, many people felt that he was not just asking this question on behalf of himself, but also on behalf of Justice Scalia. Justice Scalia and Justice Thomas had dissented from denial of certiorari in a case earlier uh, in the term in December involving the Second Amendment, and had made the point that, hey, if the Second Amendment right is a constitutional right in the Bill of Rights, it should be analyzed the same as the First Amendment rights or other rights in the Bill of Rights, and we feel that our Second Amendment cases in the lower courts are not getting that same attention. Uh, that was similar to the line of questions he asked in that case. Uh, he didn't ask another question the rest of the term. Uh, that, was, that was it. But it was certainly a nice moment uh, for the court. Um, the only other thing I'll say as an overview, really, is uh, Justices Sotomayor and Kagan have really changed the game to some extent in criminal cases because they're both very talented writers and sharp advocates, but they have very different uh, perspectives when they begin. Justice Kagan is more of an academic, comes from the federal side. Justice Sotomayor, of course, has her experience uh, to a large degree on the state side in New York, and the two of them together uh, make for a very strong voice in various, uh, various uh, criminal cases, as you will see reflected in the summaries, the summaries that are in this pamphlet uh, include not just the majority opinions, but also all the dissents and concurrences. So you can get a real picture of what was said in any particular case. So with that, uh, we're going to start uh, with Brian Stretch, who's going to start us off with some Fourth Amendment cases, uh, move to Justice Kruger and Dennis Reardon, and then I'll uh, play some cleanup at the end 
As I say, if you have a particularly strong question about a case, as we're talking about it, feel free to ask it, and we'll certainly take questions at the end. Okay, with that, Brian. Great, uh, Roy, thank you. And, and Roy, thanks so much for inviting me to participate in this panel. It is truly a, a, an honor for me to be able to be here and uh, present to you along with true legal giants as in Justice Kruger and Dennis Reardon. So uh, thank you very much, Roy. I will say just one thing about your introductions. Uh, uh, Dennis Reardon uh, did in fact success successfully defend Barry Bonds on appeal. Our office at that time successfully prosecuted him. Um, and I'm always sad when Dennis has the last word. So um, with that, Rory's asked me to um, kind of travel back to my uh, district attorney days and talk about a couple of cases I wanted to present to you today with respect to the Fourth Amendment. Uh, the first one is U.S. Uh, v. Streif, um, which is a case in which the U.S. Supreme Court took up the exclusionary rule for the first time uh, in a handful of years and, and addressed the attenuation doctrine, the, the exception to the exclusionary rule. It's a set of facts that really began almost 10 years ago um, in Utah. Um, kind of traditional police investigations. They had, were watching what, was, uh, what they believed was a house that uh, drug trafficking was going on. And the police were watching the house for a week and observed activity consistent with drug trafficking, people coming and going. They, uh, on a particular day, the officer saw defendant Streif leave the residence and observed him walk to a convenience store. Um, curious, wanting to investigate what happened, the officer stopped Streif in the parking lot, asked him for his identification, asked him what he was doing in that house. Um, once with the identification, the officer ran it through the dispatch, and lo and behold, it came back that Streif had a warrant, uh, an active pre-existing warrant uh, for his arrest. So the officer dutifully arrested Streif at that moment, and then a search incident to arrest produced drugs and paraphernalia. Um, and for those of you uh, uh, sufficiently familiar with your Fourth Amendment law, uh, certainly the officer uh, uh, made an unlawful stop uh, of Streif as he left the house. He didn't have reasonable suspicion to conduct an investigatory stop. So a motion to suppress was brought. Um, and the state argued, yes, it was an unlawful stop. However, the attenuation doctrine, that is the existence of the pre-existing warrant, attenuated the causal connection between the unlawful stop and the discovery of the drugs. Uh, the state, the district court, denied the, mo uh, denied the motion to suppress. The court of, appeal, court of Appeals affirmed. The Supreme Court of Utah reversed and then it was taken up with the United States Supreme Court who ultimately reversed. So the issue there is whether the discovery of a valid arrest warrant was a sufficient intervening event to break the causal chain between the unlawful stop and the discovery of the contraband. And the answer to that is yes it does uh, on the facts of this case. Um, Justice Thomas, writing for the majority in the case, applied the three-part Brown versus Illinois test the first prong being proximity. Um, how close in time was it between the unlawful arrest and the discovery of the narcotics? Short. Uh, and certainly that factor would favor the defendant in this case. The second prong, what was the intervening circumstance? In this case, it was a pre-existing warrant. And the court found that that was a, a, a significant intervening circumstance and uh, weighed that in favor of the state uh, for denial of the suppression. Then third prong is the purpose and flagrancy of the official misconduct. What was the officer up to? What was his conduct? And examining the conduct, the court determined that he made some good faith but innocent mistakes in handling the matter. And based on the, the evaluation of those three um, prongs, the court determined that the attenuation doctrine indeed um, uh, would be applicable to um, the exclusionary rule under these facts. Um, this will come uh, probably as no surprise to you that my view as a, a prosecutor is it's a pretty good, pretty good result. Um, but I would commend to you the, the dissent by Justice Sotomayor, um, who was joined by Justice Kagan, um, which is very, well, not joined by Justice Kagan, but Justice Kagan had her own uh, separate dissent. But Justice Sotomayor really does kind of touch upon the social strife going on, on in America today 
kind of the breakdown of trust between law enforcement and the community that law enforcement serves. This notion that this is a one-off where officers uh, can just, by happenstance, come across a pre-existing warrant is not a unique circumstance. She spends a fair amount of time detailing the statistics across America about how many active warrants are out there. Um, and certainly um, uh, references a view that uh, while the defendant in this case was white, people of color are often subject to greater stops and unlawful stops um, than uh, white people in America. And it's something to consider. And if you lob in, as uh, Rory had mentioned, Justice Kagan, um, uh, echoing much of what Sotomayor, Sotomayor had said, um, is more concerned about this being an incentive for police to go ahead and even when they don't have reasonable suspicion to go ahead and stop folks on the off chance that there might be a pre-existing warrant out there. Um, so she's, she's ringing the alarm bell with respect to that. Uh, I'd offer up just a, a couple of my personal views with respect to that. I think the vast majority of police officers want to get it right. I think everyone agrees the police officer in this situation did not did not comport himself um, uh, as required by law, nor as required by his training. Um, and my view is that the most of police officers, they want to get it right, they're trained right. Um, they are not, if they were on a routine basis stopping individuals without lawful authority, they're gonna have to explain that to their supervisors, they're gonna subject themselves to civil liability. And I think probably most importantly, the district attorney's offices around the country are not going to routinely want to bring these cases if police officers are routinely violating people's civil rights. Um, so that's the issue with respect to the attenuation doctrine to the exclusionary rule. Uh, the other qu case I want to uh, bring to your attention is Birchfield versus North Dakota, uh, which is a, a case in which the Supreme Court when it goes, uh, addresses um, the types of tests that can be administered without a search warrant. You know, the DUI laws across America over the last, you know, uh, decades have really been becoming effective, more and more effective, becoming harsher in terms of the penalties. Um, and they're also reducing the blood alcohol content that you can drive with that is legal. If you recall, in many states it used to be 0.10 and now it's dropped in many states as a 0.08. All of that is having a very helpful effect. On, the, on reducing drunk driving related fatalities. So some states have now criminalized the refusal to take um, blood tests or breath tests. Uh, so for instance, the state of North Dakota has criminalized the refusal to take a blood, breath, or urine test. The state of Minnesota has criminalized the refusal to take a breath test. Many states, uh, if you refuse to take a test, uh, there are administrative consequences that flow from that, um, uh, but it's not as necessarily criminal. Your refusal to take a test can also be, an, uh, be introduced at your trial as evidence of uh, your intoxication because you refuse to take the test. So this case, Birchfield, is a, um, a case in which three different DUI arrests and prosecutions were consolidated for appeal. Um, it's U.S. v. Uh, Bernard, uh, I'm sorry, Bernard versus Minnesota, Balin versus North Dakota, and Birchfield versus no North Dakota. So in North Dakota, Birchfield refused a blood test. Balin refused a blood, took a blood test, but only after he was threatened with criminal sanctions if he refused. And in Minnesota, Bernard uh, refused to take a breathalyzer test. Um, so all those that are consolidated, they go up to the Supreme Court. And here the majority analyzes the warrant requirements in the context of a search incident to an arrest as opposed to exigent circumstances. So in the previous uh, uh, analysis of whether or not a search warrant is required for a blood test, the analysis in, in Missouri v. Neely was really based on exigent circumstances, right? The blood alcohol content in the blood is going to dissipate over time. It's exigent to the prosecution. They have to get it before it goes. Um, Previously, under that analysis, still a search warrant was required to go ahead and draw blood against a, a, an individual as well. So the majority compares the intrusiveness of a breath, breath test versus the intrusiveness of a blood test and concludes that a breath test, relatively minor intrusion, um, and a blood test is more severe. It, pick, it pricks the skin, 
It's, a, it's more invasive in terms of the experience. It also retains the specimen for later testing for um, whatever tests that could be done on that blood as uh, time went on. Um, the, uh, importantly, the, the, the Supreme Court in this case, and again, this is Justice Alito writing for the majority, instead of taking a case-by-case -case, uh, basis on stops, determined that a categorical, a categorical rule was uh, required to provide guidance to the officers out on the street every day. Um, and so they concluded, based on their analysis of the intrusiveness and the search in incident to the rest doctrine, that yes, in terms of compelling a blood draw, um, a search warrant is required. In terms of compelling a breath test, no search warrant is required. And so if you're keeping score, you've got Birchfield and Balin both get the reversals because one took the blood, blood test after being threatened with criminal prosecution and the other one refused the blood test. So those criminal convictions were reversed. Uh, with respect to Bernard, who was threatened with a breath test, which is legal because you don't need a warrant, um, his conviction stands. Um, so kind of the, the final takeaway for the states who are now looking whether or not to um, amend their DUI laws, um, states can now criminalize the refusal to take a breath test, but they cannot criminalize the refusal to take a blood test. Justice Sotomayor is joined by Justice Ginsburg. Um, and they both agree that a search warrant is required for a blood test, but they both agree that a search warrant would be required for a breath test as well. And then Justice Thomas, who was siding with the law and order folks on the North Dakota legislature, uh, believes that no search warrants are required for any such tests. Um, and so my, uh, my parting piece on this is for those of you who are from out of state and after a long conference and a great conference, and if you're having a few glasses of wine tonight, uh, take Uber home. Um, if you're driving uh, and you refuse, a blood, if you refuse a test here in the state of California, it is not a crime, but there are administrative consequences that will flow from that. So if you're evaluating Good, I'm definitely over. Maybe I'll refuse. The penalties will be weaker. Um, I will now tell you that most of the counties in California will now go get a search warrant. So if you're refusing in California, the, uh, the counties will now, now go get a search warrant um, to do a compulsory blood draw. Okay, Rory? That's great. Um, let me ask the other panelists, any, anything you want to say about either of those two cases? I have one thing I'd like to say about Utah versus Streif. Um, so Utah versus Streif, right, is the case where the officer stops someone without suspicion and detains them, conceitedly unlawful stop. Um, Justice Sotomayor's dissent is the most uh, powerful, dramatic dissent uh, that she's written, I think, since she's been on the court, and it echoes way back to some dissents that you might have heard from Justice Marshall uh, 20, 30 years ago. Um, let me, just, let me just say that, first, she, she does not shy away from the racial implications of this. She says, you know, minorities are much more likely to have outstanding traffic warrants. And this is just a traffic warrant. Some of you may have outstanding traffic warrants, and you don't know it. Because if you paid a ticket late, sometimes a warrant is automatically issued, and, and it can be there. Um, I have actually done some surveying in the local sheriff's department here in San Francisco. This is admittedly 20 years ago, but the warrant system was a paper system, and they had people who were students in high school after school. Their job was to sort of take out the ones that were uh, no good anymore, which meant there were a lot of mistakes. Um, Justice, Justice Sotomayor says, you know, um, this is a race issue, this is a police trust issue, this is a citizen issue, and, it, and she cites uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, James Baldwin, uh, and uh, I don't know how you say his first name, Coates, Ta-Nehisi -Ta Coates. Um, here's how, what she says at the end. Uh, this decision implies you are not the citizen of a democracy, but the subject of a carceral state. Unlawful police stops corrode our civil liberties and threaten our lives, white and black, guilty and innocent. Until their voices matter too, I think, obviously, I think, echoing uh, Black Lives Matter, our justice system will continue to be anything but. That's her last sentence. Our justice system will continue to be anything but. It's a pretty dramatic um, sort of comeback, if you will. To me, the other interesting thing to think about if you're a Supreme Court inside baseball player like I am and two or three other people in the universe are, um, it was five to three. Justice Scalia was absent. 
Uh, it's hard to say where Justice Scalia would have been. Justice Scalia dissented in the case that says you can take a DNA test uh, from somebody who's been arrested. Justice Scalia has said he doesn't believe reasonable suspicion has any basis in the text, and, and the Terry case may be badly founded. On the other hand, he doesn't like the exclusionary rule, uh, and, he's not, and he wrote the attenuation case from a few years ago that they cite. Hard to say where he would have been. But had he been on the court, it would have been 5-4. And I'm not sure Justice Breyer would have joined the majority, which he did do, and which he does do in Fourth Amendment cases for the government very frequently. Uh, that may, this may be a case, a very important case, where that absence made some difference. Uh, and, and I think it's the most significant case of the term. That's, that's mine. And I think Brian did a great job of, of reporting it to you, um, as well as I was glad he told us what the law is in California on DUI, because I wasn't sure. <laughs> you, you can't escape it. They're, they're coming for your blood here. <laughs> okay. Um.